Hello, dear students. I hope you are doing very well. I hope you are managing as you should in the course UGRC 150. If you engage it, then you should do fine. I don't think that you should be that stressed. As you know, we are doing purely online teaching of the course and learning of it as well. So you will access all content as a card. And then for this particular group, you know that you have information on how to access all videos uploaded for you. We do well to also add the interactive sessions that we have engaged that we feel are useful for other students who may want to engage it again or may want to review it. Okay, so in this video, I will take you through the unit three. Now we are trying to present the content in a way that is accessible to you, even as a video lecture. But the focus would be that you would have engaged the, the reading material, the test book itself, as guided by the units, okay? And then the course outline, which you can find on Sakai. We need you to do that because then it helps you to keep the focus of the discussion. And then you get a guide that makes the lectures meaningful to you, but more importantly, that gives you some more inputs, some more additional illustration. If you do not study the content in tandem with the course outline and the test, then you may you found wondering a little bit more before you settle in. So what am I saying? Study this lecture videos with the course syllabus or the course outline and the test book itself. And then I think that you should do very fine. So we are discussing unit three and I am doing so very, uh, clear in my mind that I have engaged the units one and two with you in this group for this course. If you haven't seen the lecture videos for units one and two for this group, then you would want to do well to do that. All those uh, content have been uploaded on your resources. The links are there. If you're on the channel, you will see uh, the content proper, the video proper. Okay, so in unit three, we will look at correcting ambiguity. We will look at vagueness and equivocation. You would have seen equivocation already in my earlier uploaded videos. So here, we will want to use the discussion to show you the difference between equivocation and ambiguity. If you haven't seen equivocation already, then it makes it difficult. That's the point I'm making. So you study in a coherent manner so you can get clarity. Look at illustrations of ambiguity and how to disambiguate you know, uh, expressions. Then we will clarify the sentences of the word law. This is also in your unit five of the test book. Why are we bringing it here? Because it gives you some good example of an equivocation. So we are studying the unit three, but we get a good you know, illustration of a term that we can be very equivocal about. That is the term law. And there is a discussion of the various senses, various, various connotations of the word law in unit five. So you see how we are studying in a coordinated manner. And that is why if you are following consistently, you shouldn't lose out at all. You will get the, the, the connection between the various units and then that can guide how you are also studying. Then we will look at identifying types of discourse. Discourse, no longer types of sentences, but a collection of sentences, a passage, the different types of passages that we can have. And then we'll dwell more on one type of discourse called argument, which is useful to the logician or the critical thinker. So you will see some other types of discourses, but our focus will be on the type called argument and how the, the thinker the critical thinker uses that. So some problematic uses of language. Problematic because it doesn't give us the clarity we seek. 
when we use language. When you hear you are being ambiguous, that sounds equivocal. This is quite vague. These are not terms you should be proud of. They are supposed to be problematic uses of language that you do not want to be caught as a culprit in it, using language that way, but you wouldn't also want others exploiting your intelligence by using language that way. So first, as a check on yourself, but more importantly, as a way of preventing others from, uh, from getting you uh, exploited language-wise. So if you see someone being a provoker, you prompt. If you think that a person sounds vague, you seek for clarity, etc. Now, what are these terms? What do they mean? We want to diagnose ambiguity first. When do we say an expression is ambiguous? When a statement is made on the screen now, please, but that one statement can have two different meanings. And the intended meaning is not clear from the statement, then we say it is ambiguous. So you have only one statement standing there like that, one expression, but that expression could have two different meanings, ambi two. The expression itself is one, but it could mean two different, sometimes even three or four. Then we say that your expression was ambiguous. Okay, we are not talking about just one word repeating itself with eight different connotations. That would have been equivocation. See, we have studied that. Here, again, we are talking about one expression. The full expression is sitting there but you can think of it as meaning two different things and both apply. So it is not clear to you what the intended meaning is. Why? Because it has, that one expression could mean more than one. Then we think that that is a, a, a problem labeled as what ambiguity, ambiguous. So I put it here, compare equivocation. For equivocation, you would have one specific term or word repeated in the, the, the context of use. So you would have that word repeated, but each time it is used, a different meaning of that same word is being applied without notice to you, the, the hearer. That is what we criticize as what equivocation. By ambiguity, you are not dealing with just one word repeated differently, but you are dealing with a full expression that is sitting there one and then could have more than one meaning. Okay, let's look at some examples for clarity. So on the screen now, you would see example one I'm highlighting. I have always wanted to apply for leave to take a course in critical thinking. And now I finally have. Now I finally have. We are showing you where the problem is. When you say, and now I finally have, you render this whole single expression, what, ambiguous. And now I finally have done what? See what you said, I have always wanted to apply for leave to take a course. First, I have always wanted to apply for leave and then what, to take a course. So when you say, and now I finally have, we want you to clarify. But this could mean, and now I finally have applied for leave. It could also mean, and now I finally have taken a course in critical thinking. We cannot presume what you mean for you. For you, you would have to clarify. So if you think, and now I finally have taken the leave, say so. Or if now I finally have taken a course in critical thinking, you say so. But if you leave it as such, then you are saying, and now I finally have, and we would want to know have done what. So the expression is one, but the additional phrase here, this phrase doesn't help us clearly determine what you were referring to. Both meanings, as I have outlined, apply. And therefore, if I asked you to disambiguate this expression, you would tell me this expression could mean I have always wanted to apply for leave to take a course in critical thinking, and now I finally have applied for the leave. That's one meaning, full stop. Then you do the other one, and then it is clear to us that there is no longer an ambiguity. So when you are asked to disambiguate, you are just being asked to de detach or separate or clearly 
create those two expressions that we would have had if we took away the ambiguous phrase. What phrase or what word is accountable for the ambiguity? In this, our example, the, word, the phrase is what? And now I finally have. The question is, I finally have done what? Let's look at the second one. Angry goat, ingest farmer with cutlass. You can tell that these are all from your textbook so that it is easier to connect the understanding you got from the text with the lecture, okay? So you would now get some clarity, I hope, if you have at least, uh, you know, engaged the test. Angry goat ingest farmer with cutlass. Now, if I say angry goat ingest farmer with cutlass, is it that the angry goat was holding the cutlass and used it to injure the farmer, or that it was a farmer who is holding the cutlass, and this farmer holding a cutlass has been injured by the angry goat. You do not want to say, oh, but this is obvious. There is nothing like obvious, because we know sometimes our movies show us, wow, wow quite strange stuff. You want the ambiguity clarified. The ambiguity is coming from the use of the word with. Is it with cutlass as in the one holding the cutlass or with cutlass as in the thing using the cutlass to hit? So if you are asked to disambiguate, you state the two separate meanings that can be made from this expression. All right. Now look at the third one, also from your textbook. Disappearing into a hole, I saw a mouse. Disappearing into a hole, I saw a mouse. Now, I'm sure you know what the amb ambiguity is. Is it that as I was disappearing into a hole, then I saw a mouse? Or I saw a mouse which was uh, disappearing, so to speak, into a hole. You need to clarify that. So the source of ambiguity is what? Disappearing into a hole. That's highlighted for you. Now, the, the very fourth one, I think it's a straightforward, ambiguous expression that need not be disambiguated for you to see. You can clearly see how ambiguous that is. Free techie. Is it set the nation techie free or free the techie that has been earmarked for Christmas celebration? Or do we have free techie that we are giving out here, the chicken, chicken's brother or chicken sister called techie that we are here to give out freely or what? Free check. See how ambiguous that expression is and needs to be clarified. Now I have some very interesting slides that I can give credit to my colleague. Uh, I saw these uh, funny slides that really capture ambiguity and I need you to see. So see, uh, my colleague, Dr. Casey, all credits to him. Look at that. On the screen, have, I'm illustrating ambiguous claims, claims that, oh, you know, sound as if they are saying one thing, but could also mean another. And so we say that is ambiguous. Students cook and serve grandparents. Oops. <laughs> Did they cut their grandparents into chunks and put in the saucepan and ooh, served that to the public? Or they cooked some meal and served that meal to Granny and Co. You see, if you just say students cook and serve grandparents, the ambiguity is there. I think you can see it. Some more examples. San Jose, cops kill man with knife. I think that we have seen with, you know, just like the example with a uh, angry good injured farmer with cutlass. Slow children crossing, look at that. Am I saying the children crossing the road are slow? Or we are saying you should slow down because children are crossing. You see, at least those two interpretations show you the ambiguity there. Now see St. Martha's Epis, what is that Episcopal Church? This is a church. <laughs> what do you see there? We love hurting people. Woo. We love hurting people. Is it that you love to hurt people or you love people who have been 
pet, rape, uh, divorce, what have you, so they are welcome. Or you are saying that you are good at making people feel bad. Clarify that, otherwise we have issues with ambiguity. Now, priest marries his own son. <laughs> Is it that the priest became the wife of his own son or the husband of his own son or that he blessed the marriage of his son and his son's wife or husband to be whatever, okay? So you have to clarify otherwise. So you've seen our free techie too. Now, all the examples previously given were ambiguities, ambiguous claims, and I've showed you why. Let's recall equivocation so that we know that we cannot confuse equivocation with ambiguity. Now, when do we say one is being equivocal? It has been already said, but we want to highlight it a bit more. Recall, if different connotations of one word are used in the same context without notice to the audience, the speaker is accused of being a provoker. See, you use the different connotations of one word as if they mean the same. You see, the word is one, but it has different meaning. So if you're using the different meanings of that one word in the same context as if they mean the same, and you do not prompt the listener, then we accuse you of being equivocal. So on the screen now, look at one example again, credit to my colleague, noisy children are a real headache. Two aspirin will make a headache go away. Therefore, two aspirin will make noisy children go away. Here we are talking about children being a real headache. And then the, the second use of the word headache. So equivocation points out something. Equivocation says that there is headache here, headache there, okay? So we are using the word headache twice, but in each of the uses, we mean it differently. And so if we don't correct it, then we we'll say two aspirin will make noisy children go away. Now that is a provocation. This is not ambiguity per se. Even though if an expression is a provocal, we may, it may lead to an ambiguous understanding of it, but the two are not exactly the same. The chair invited the chair to speak soon after the chair sat down. The chair invited the chair <laughs> to sit soon after the chair. The chair invited the chair to speak soon after the chair sat on the chair. Okay, now that is I paid for it to work. Okay, come on. The chair, maybe you should write down your name. Say, come and write down your name. The chair invited the chair to speak soon after the chair sat on the chair. Now you see that the person, the person is using using the different connotations of the word chair in the same context without signaling the audience that I have moved from the meaning of chair as that which we sit on to the meaning of chair as the one who steers the affairs of a meeting. So there we go. My colleague bachelors gave up their bachelors to fix bachelors. See, that's equivocation, big time. Different uses of the word bachelor okay, without a signal to your audience. Ghana is a free country, so we should feel free to come to work at any time. Being a free country, this connotation of the word free is not what we mean when we say so. You should feel free to come to work at any time. This sense of free and this sense of free are not referring to the same meaning of the word freedom. And so if you refer to the earlier lecture on equivocation, it should throw some bit more light on the distinction between equivocation and ambiguity. Now, the third crime or the third expression that we find problematic is an expression that is vague. And vague is when, look at the screen now, when you use a word in a way that its intended meaning is indeterminate or unclear or imprecise. Apart from when you use an expression in a, an idiomatic way, 
symbolic way, or the other one proverbial. In other words, when you are not using language directly, literally, but you are using it symbolically, proverbial, mm, uh, uh, figuratively, then we would say metaphorically, then we would say you would be vague. That kind of vagueness actually is intentionally so. When we speak in proverbs, it is because we don't want to speak directly for everyone to hear. We want to be discreet. Okay, so when it is metaphorical, proverbial, etc., then it is intentionally vague. But sometimes you do not intend to be vague, but you are. When do we label you as such? When you use language in an imprecise manner, in a, in a general manner, so much so that we can de determine the right reference. You see, ambiguity is so clear, the expression is clear, so clear that it leads us to more than one meaning. That's ambiguity. Okay, equivocation is clear, but it, now we, we, we cannot tell which of the meanings is okay, oscillating between the meanings, but it is clear. Vagueness, it is not clear at all what you are referring to specifically. So here you see indeterminate or unclear. And you get some more examples to study this lecture in tandem with your course content material proper. So see the example. The provost said he will be here any moment from now. This is a quote. It means say the secretary is reporting that to the student group that came to ask about the provost. The question is when the secretary says any moment from now, is she referring to any moment from now as was said by the provost? Then, so the provost called in the morning and said, tell the student that I'll be there any moment from now. Then the secretary passes that information on to the student. The provost says he will come any moment from now. Then the student reps are telling the police, the provost says he's coming in any moment from now. Any moment from now is emphasized. Give specific. You should ask for that, or you should say that yourself. I'm coming to class soon. It's a vague expression. You need to ask, Doc, please, can we have some specific time, respectfully, so that the class can be properly informed? Okay, give me 10 minutes because I am at the gate now. That is clearer than accepted. You can come for your passport soon. Soon can be 10 years. John the Baptist told us at the time he was alive that. The, the second coming is soon, or Jesus is coming soon. You know, soon is intentionally <laughs> vague in the Bible. We are still waiting, eagerly though, but you cannot put a time to it. Soon is vague. Vague means it is not specific. It is not precise. It is meant to be hidden. So if you seek clarity, then you should point out the source of vagueness and seek that clarity. For the Bible one, you could reflect and meditate, and hopefully you should hear from the Father on that. Any graduate who is not finding a job is not looking hard enough. I'm sure by now you would see why looking hard enough is a problematic expression. Which problem do we have with it? It is vague. What does it mean to look hard enough? It's impressive. It's unclear. What does it mean to, to you? Should you start by the notice and look at the notice for advert? Hard, how is that supposed to be done? Your textbook has some fine examples on any man who is not sleeping with a lady or raping a lady or something, is not forcing a lady to have intimacy with, is not a real man. Now that is problematic. Okay, what does it mean to be a real man? Eh? So those of us walking around are not real. All right, so that is vagueness. Now on the screen, you see that we are going on to see some expressions such as metaphors and proverbs that are intentionally and purposefully vague or open-ended. They are not meant to be interpreted literally. And I've already mentioned that. So if I say, yeah, yeah, it's a flower. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd doesn't mean I, have, I am a sheep with four legs. When you come into my office, you will see a sheep with four legs. You will find me seated with two legs. But when I say the Lord is my shepherd, I'm speaking figuratively, metaphorically. And this is intentionally big. No man is an island. 
has an implication. No one can lick their elbow. Life is war. Doesn't mean you should take, you know, guns and follow people or the best. Follow people and go and fight. When we say life is war, they are all intentionally open-ended and big. I wish I would say any questions, but I'm sure we'll have our live sessions where you bring all questions that you still have, and we are glad to help you understand. After you have listened in to the lecture and you have studied it in tandem with your content profile, then your questions are clearer and the responses we give you are more useful to you. Otherwise, we just repeat the same thing over and over again, and you will have the tedious task of having to listen into more than eight lectures on just one topic, in addition to all your other courses that you are doing. See, so let's work this way for your own understanding. Now, verbal dispute versus substantive disagreement. You will see that that is the next section in your unit three, distinguishing the two, distinguishing between a dispute that is based on language, verb, verb, and then a disagreement that is substantive is based on values, subscribing to different points of view. So let's go back and see. When disputants, two people are disputing supposedly, but it seems that their disagreement borders on what? The inconsistent use of language, words. Inconsistent use of words simply means I am using the word in a way that you are not using it because of perhaps facts that are available to you, etc. But then it is possible for us to agree on the meaning of the word. Then it means that we actually were not disagreeing. It was just a language issue. Someone needed to clarify our use of language. And then one of us or the two of us would say, oh, okay. And then actually, we were in disagreement. So the inconsistent use of a word is what generates a verbal dispute. And this can easily be resolved. How? By stipulating the meaning. Remember, stipulative definition. If you haven't listened to the second lecture on definition, you won't understand it. If you haven't listened to the lecture or you haven't engaged the topic on lecture two definitions, this will be extra work for you. But if you have, then this becomes clearer to you, okay? So look at this example. She's a nurse. Then I say, no, she's a health worker instead. <laughs> that is not a substantive disagreement at all. This is a verbal dispute. How do you know that? Because nurses are actually health workers. So there isn't a disagreement between the two of us. We are only using different words to refer to the same thing. Someone should just tell us, I'm still referring to this verbal dispute. Someone should just tell us, oh, a nurse is just a health worker. It is a mango. No, it is a fruit. I said it's a mango. No, it's not a mango. It is a fruit. It's a mango. It is a fruit. Is that a, a disagreement? No. Someone should just tell us that mangoes are just a type, an instance, an example of fruit. And then there will be no longer a disagreement. So it wasn't substantively a disagreement. It was merely a dispute. And so how do you resolve verbal disputes by stipulative definition? Can we, however, resolve substantive disagreements? We may never be able to. We may never be able to resolve substantive disagreement. Why? Because it is not about language and its use. Where just a stipulative definition will resolve it. It is about deep people subscribing to different values. You see, people subscribing to different values. And just like uh, uh, one person thinking that this should be the case, another person thinks this shouldn't be the case, and these are value-oriented, perhaps religious values, cultural values, you know, contextual values, etc. It makes it difficult to think that you will see the same thing if we were observing, okay? So issues that border on values may never be resolved. We try to help others see it the way we see it. How? By presenting arguments. So argue, we are going to see what an argument is in a minute. We present premises. That it just means evidence, reasons why you should see it the way we see it. But the person may not. So the political party may not see it as the other political party sees it. So some may be social democrats, others may be property owning democracy. You know, uh, uh, so for church, they may all be looking at 
supposed issue in the Bible, a verse, but their interpretation of it may differ. So some may say we have to worship on a Saturday, others say it is wrong to worship on a Sunday. Some may say, well, speaking in tongues is what defines you as a Christian. Other person may say, no, just getting baptized is enough. So these are not matters bordering on language. These are about how the, the observer, the disputant, prescribe what should be the case. Remember our discussion of value judgment versus factual statement, unit one. If you haven't listened to that, you will struggle a bit. So just pause, go to that content, read it, look at how we distinguish value judgment from, if you like, definitions and factual statements. And then it should help your understanding of a disagreement that is labeled as substantive. Okay, I'm not talking about you having different feelings because feelings would be describing emotive expressions. I'm talking about you thinking of an issue from a different point of view, value, value judgment. It is still a statement, but it is tied to a point of view. Now, see an example. She's a nurse because she has a certificate from the training school. Then Koju says, no, she's not really a nurse because she does not care for her patient. Now, this is not a matter of bringing extra evidence. This is a matter of what Kofi thinks should, should qualify someone as a nurse and what Koju thinks should. So when we are talking should, should, we are talking values. What I think should be the definition of a nurse really is not having a certificate. If you have a certificate and you're not taking care of your patient, you aren't really a nurse. We don't care what society calls you. That's for your argument. So you can bring him all the certificates the, the lady has gathered and piled up in her box. For Kojo, if she's not really taking care of her patient, then he, Kojo, will not think of her as a real nurse. So this disagreement may never be resolved. You can bring all the evidence in the world it will not resolve it easily because it is a matter of values, not a matter of fact. Now, why do we need this? So that if you need to help people resolve matters, is it faith matter? Are you an evangelist? Are you a political party, women's organizer? Are you a marketer? Is the issue that you are sending out there to help win people to your side? Is it bordering on facts or values? Is the disagreement a substantive one or a value one? Are you helping to resolve, say, <laughs> the, the conflict between ethnic groups? Are you a state policymaker? You should know that some disagreements border on what? Facts. So extra facts can help us resolve it. Then it is not substantive per se. Some too, even when you present the facts, people will have their prescription of what the fact is. And so the disagreement really is not on the factual matter, but on how people perceive that fact and their viewpoint to that fact. Then it means you are dealing with a substantive issue. And so your, your way of redressing or addressing it must go beyond just producing facts. You would have to argue and present evidence and hope that the people will see it the way you see it. And then in other instances, the disagreement is merely verbal. That man is fancy. No, he's not. He's a can. That's a verbal dispute. All these other examples, she's not a real Christian because she doesn't speak in tongues, are in your textbook. I would pause. Well, maybe let's finish it. So you would see that. This is an instance, unit five, what I've put here, the normative versus the empirical law slide. I think there are two or three of them. Our instance is just an example of equivocation at play that will help you understand when people are using the word law, but they are either confusing the criminal sense of the word law with the logical sense of it or with a, another a moral sense of the word law. Okay, the first you see law there, doesn't mean the different connotations of the word law apply. So if someone says that these people are going against the law, why is it that they, they are men and they say they are women? God will punish them one day. I mean, the law of God doesn't apply. Just what I said 
has used three different computations. They are going against the law as it was the law of Ghana. But then God will punish them. It's divine law, or if you like, another sense of the word law. In the next minute, when it comes to the lecture, I'll cry. Look at the way everyone, everyone is frowning and looking at them. After all, they are breaking the law of society. Maybe you have entered into moral law or you have gone into a, a customary law, etc. So we want us all to be careful when we are equivocating on a certain term. And that unit gives you a very nice, fine example of that. So you will engage it. You see normative laws, how they prescribe, whilst uh, empirical laws describe how the world is. This discussion there, which I am introducing you to and helping you see the link with what I've done so far, will show you if, how value judgment and definitions and factors are playing a game here. And so when we engage the substantive content in it five, then you say, but you get the discussion there, the normative versus the empirical, mm, scientific laws as empirical, and yet normative laws as what predictions. And so that you will see when we say it is a law of nature, that whenever you throw a ball up, it will come down. You can confuse that with a, a, the law of accounts, for example, social and empirical law like economics. Whenever prices and of goods and services are increased, quantity demanded will fall. Then people in, in increase fuel. Well, will I go and buy a teaspoon of fuel? I won't be able to move my car. So that law won't apply here. Why is it that certain laws seem to be binding? But they are prescriptions. That is how we must do things. And then other laws seem to be empirical, it's relaxed. You know, when people don't obey that law or the system doesn't obey it, you rather change that. I'm going to engage you substantively on that, the normative versus the empirical. But for this, our unit three, where I touch on this, I'm just using the discussion there to help you understand equivocation when we are playing on different senses of the word law. So you will see it here, natural law, civil law, statutory law, customary law, you see moral law, logical law, these are all different connotations of the word law. And so we want you to be careful not to confuse these different senses of the word law and commit equivocation. We will do our first assessment on units one, two, and some aspects of three why because they repeat themselves there. They, those aspects of unit three, you see it in unit two also. So it is substantively units one and two assessment. It is in your interest to study it, study the content, be guided by the course outline, and then study the video lecture. And if you put the three together, you should score your 10 marks for that and get ready for the other. Get subscribed so that you get prompts when videos are uploaded and visit your Sakai site daily, morning and evening. I wish you a wonderful week until our next interactive session. Pay your group. So this goes for my main campus group two, my city campus group three and four. You know your specific course site, so you go there and get the, the details for each one of them. I'll see you shortly. A wonderful week and all the best.